Sweden is a home to hundreds of thousands seeking refuge. But this country is at a critical turning point. Yeah, maybe people here is not so happy to see cameras. <laughs> More than 300 people have left Sweden to join so-called Islamic State and other jihadi groups. Per capita, that's one of the highest figures in Europe. Just describe to me what Raqqa was like. After my husband died, I started to see things that were not from their religion. Vulnerable young people targeted by radicals. I like this country. I love many of these people here. And the best thing for them, what I think, is Allah's laws. Are Sweden's authorities doing enough to stop the spread of radical Islam? Uh, Nick? Yeah. Can we stop filming? Gothenburg is one of Sweden's most diverse cities. It should be a model for integration. But this port city is one of Europe's biggest exporters of militants to Syria and Iraq. We're in a secret location. I'm about to meet a young woman who says she's just returned from Syria. She traveled there with her husband, who died fighting for so-called Islamic State. Because she's vulnerable, we've agreed to hide her identity. Just describe to me what Raqqa was like. In the beginning, I thought it was really good, and I was very happy to be there. But after my husband died, I started to see things that were not from their religion. Tell me what was wrong. When they burned the Jordanian pilots, I asked them, why they burn up a human being? Is that right in Islam? What I know is that you are not allowed to burn anyone. Were you talking to other women about this as well? The other people you were meeting? No, you cannot talk to other people about these things because they will tell on you and if they tell on you, they will kill you. What do you think now when you hear about other young people who go from places like Sweden to join ISIS in Syria or Iraq? I think that they have no knowledge, that they are not clear in their brain. They should read because they will change their mind when they go there. So what's going wrong here? We're driving to the northeastern suburb of Angered, a community of 50,000 people on the outskirts of Gothenburg. Many of these kids who travel to places like Syria and Iraq come from places like this, immigrant neighborhoods on the fringes of Sweden's towns and cities. Sweden's massive housing shortage and long waits for rent-controlled apartments mean that many new arrivals end up here and stay here. 11% unemployment levels are higher than average and more than 65% of young people drop out of school. Three years ago, this video by local rap artists caused uproar in Sweden. The use of graphic imagery was condemned by politicians who said political violence solves nothing. The message behind that particular music video is the frustration that alienation can create. A lot of people in our society, they feel like they are not a part of the Swedish society. Havel Nazar 
and Karwan Faraj were both in that video. And Karwan worked with us on this film, helping to introduce us to people in Angaret. But you're inciting violence and hatred. So it's easy to label it as violence when in fact it's fiction. But there are people in that video who have duct tape over their mouths. Yeah, because they have talking a lot of shit, so they need to have that on their mouth. And they have telling us, in these areas, we're going to do this and that for you. And after we vote on them, they do nothing. The police, they cannot come here in these areas every time and be safe. What do you mean by that? They cannot control these areas. Yeah, the distrust is too big. Police in Angaret come under regular attack. These pictures were taken two weeks ago. The area is classified as vulnerable, with high rates of crime, gang violence, and drug offenses. This guy is the man. <laughs> it is oh, angry. <laughs> He's a good guy, you know? Abu Muradi, Ulf Bostrom is Sweden's only integration officer. By getting to know people living here, <laughs> he's trying to build trust in the police. Hello, hello. What are you up against? We have lost more than 50% of the policemen working in, in uniform. You can see for yourself. There are no police. How many policemen have you been seeing uh, during your, your time here? Have you seen any? Huh? No. No. So wh Don't you ask you, wh why isn't there any visible uh, police officer here? So what you're saying is that the police have let these people down and the community down here? Yes. Last November, the country's terror alert was raised to full the first time in Sweden's history, indicating a major security threat. Why have you brought us here? This is a little Egyptian communities, which are cops. Okay. And um, if you know what has uh, happened during the past years, especially when uh, Morsi were the president of Egypt, Yes. More than 200 churches were burned down during his one year. So the Christian cops in, in, uh, in Egypt, they have problems and they bring their stories with them. Earlier this year, police got a warning that this Coptic Christian church was at risk of an imminent attack. They came to visit me at home and just to inform me that this church is about to explode through Al Qaeda. <laughs> so, such problems. <laughs> this is, you know, alarming that, that in Sweden this would be happening. Well, what's happening to this society? Yeah, it is alarming. And we should take it seriously. Tell them about that story that happened to you in, in Malmö. A guy uh, get up into the train, and then he came beside me and uh, he said in Arabic, which I can understand, uh, that we will slay you, we'll be hitting you. Then I looked to him and say, okay, do you mean you will kill me and kill others? He said, yes, we will do. Did you think that you would ever experience something like this in Sweden? In Sweden? In Sweden, exactly not. Kawan, our fixer, has had a call. We going to meet the guy. Someone wants to talk to us about how IS is recruiting in Angaret. Yeah, maybe people here is not so happy to see cameras. <laughs> it's vulnerable young people that the extremists target. Yeah, we need to stop film here, so, and wait for him. We've just met our contact. We've been asked not to film with him until he puts on his disguise. How was your day? What did you do today? It was a good day. I was at work. He's understandably frightened, so we head to a safe location. Why have 
you decided to talk to us? I wanted people to know about this manipulation. They tried to sweet talk us into joining ISIS or IS as it's called now. They wanted us to join them, people of our surroundings, people we know. So they came to you, but what were they saying to you? Like a big brother will say to you, like a father will say to you, stop doing drugs, stop hitting people, come with us instead. Fight for God. Fight for Allah. Just describe to me this guy. What was he like? Was he religious? This guy's been a criminal just like me and has done lots of bad stuff. And now he's coming to me and telling me you have to change. You, you wanted to reject this and say, no, I don't want to do this? In the beginning, I wanted to do it. I wasn't scared. I was more eager to go down and help my Muslim brothers. When you say down there, you mean Syria and Iraq? Yes. But then after a while, when I saw both pictures and videos and many things, and yes, I was very scared. We're back in the center of Gothenburg. It's by engaging with different faith groups that Sweden's integration officer Ulf Bostrom hopes to stop problems before they happen. Ulf, where are we going? We are going to uh, the area called Bellevue. What do we know about this place? It is one of the biggest mosques. And um, when you take a small mosque, you don't have many visitors to a small mosque. When you have a very big mosque, you have many visitors. And with many visitors means that you can't know everyone. Many of the people who have gone to Syria and Iraq have a connection here. Reports in Swedish media have claimed that the mosque has ties to various Islamist and terrorist designated organizations. He shouldn't be alone, really. Really? No, I just stand closer. Watch his back. We're just getting permission to be able to film around here now. That, they were closed. Okay. Uh, Nick? Yeah. Uh, can we stop filming? Yeah, sure. So no one from the mosque will talk to us. But we know the spiritual leader of Al-Shabaab, Hassan Hussein, was invited here in 2009. And it's where IS fighter Mikhail Skromo preached. <sighs> this is the mosque. There's a little bit of... it's a bit tense here. Um, yeah, you can say it's a little bit tense. Isn't that strange? I mean, this is Sweden. Um, according to uh, the people that uh, are here, uh, they have felt that uh, media, newspapers and television... The law was changed making it illegal to travel abroad intending to commit acts of terrorism. We're now waiting for a young man to arrive. We're being told he's been radicalized and he's got some hardline views that he wants to talk to us about. Hello. For his safety, we've agreed to protect his identity. Thank you. First of all, I haven't pledged allegiance to any group. This is my Muslim beliefs. I believe that all of Allah's laws should prevail above all other laws. But of course I have friends, some of them are extreme in their views. Some have been through the wars in Syria and Iraq. Sweden is a liberal democracy, it's not an Islamic country. Yes, I know. So you saying that you want to bring your laws into this country goes against the values of this country? I want it. I believe it's a form of flight. This is nothing bad for them. Of course I want to share it with others. I want it. It's not that I want to bump someone here or there. I don't think like that, but other people may think like that. I, I'm confused okay. by what you want, what you're trying to say. I like this country. I love many of these people here. I want the best for them. And the best thing for them, what I think is Allah's laws. I've 
come away from that interview feeling frightened. Frightened for this young man because he holds such extreme views and because I don't think he understands what he's getting himself into. And frightened for this country because I don't think they're fully prepared for what's happening in their towns and cities. I catch up with Havel Nazar, the musician I met earlier. We're going to my mother's house. Uh, this is where I grew up. Hello, salam, Sabiha Almas fled Iraq and arrived in Sweden in 1988 with her four sons. Why do you think so many young people from your community have left here and travelled to places like Syria and Iraq for jihad? How do you feel when you hear young people say they don't feel Swedish? I mean, Hava, your mom has a point, doesn't she? She she fled a war. I didn't. What could happen if these problems aren't addressed? You can't have a part of the population feeling that they're shut out. And it's even stressful for the dominant part of society feeling that they have to shut people out. We have to come together. And it, of course, it, it takes two to tangle. With so many youngsters turning their backs on Sweden, people are understandably asking, what has gone wrong? We're at Swedish television. Ulf's going to be debating his boss tonight. Good morning, how are you? How are you feeling? Uh, good. A little bit tense. He wants to speak out against what he sees as the failings of the police. What are you going to do? Tell the truth. Svensk polis är i kris av det knappast undgås någon. Ulf Boström, du är polis som jobbar mycket i de här utsatta förorterna. Hur illa skulle du säga att läget är? Ja, det är mycket allvarligt. Alltså, det råder en stor förvirring. Våra poliser är välutbildade och kloka. Men vår rikspolischef och polisledningen runt honom är ytterst förvirrade. Mindre samhällen och kommuner, där har polisstationerna försvunnit. Poliserna har försvunnit. Jag kanske också ska komma ihåg att varje dygn tar vi emot 3400 anmälningar. Vi åker på över 3000 larm i polismyndigheten. Ibland blir det inte bra. Ibland, Exakt, ibland kan vi... Hello Mr. Klaus. Hey. I'm Yalda from the BBC. Okay, hello. Nice to speak to you. We're just wondering if we could have a word with you. Mm. Ulf has said to us that superiors within the police department have let the people of Gothenburg and Ungered down, that there is no law and order and security. What do you think? Of course there is law and order, but uh, we must improve our work in these uh, areas. But we've, we've actually met people who are afraid. They've spoken to us with their faces covered yeah. and disguised yeah. because they say that there's almost a their own policing that's going on by the radicals mm. in these communities. Mm. Are you aware of that? Yes. We have problem with, with, with a, a pa parallel uh, society in these areas. How did that go, Wolf? Well, how do you explain 38 years in, in 20 seconds? <laughs> but I'm satisfied anyway, yeah. Do you think that you're being naive, though? We're all humans, it's just... We just need to get the right knowledge. And we have to be honest and show respect to people. And do those people... And we have to be patient doing that. And those people need to show respect to Swedish society? Yes, of course. The majority do that. It's only a minority that, that are making problems. But that minority is growing.
Sweden is now at a critical turning point in the fight against IS. How the country responds to that threat in its towns and cities could have major global consequences.